On the border, what President Donald Trump says about a new section of the barrier between the United States and Mexico. Public update. Officials give their first remarks on the discovery of baby remains at the house of an abortion doctor. We have a report and reaction. The new evangelization. How the Vatican views the current crisis of faith. And visitors welcome. One of the nation's most iconic landmarks reopens with the help of the First Lady. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, September 19th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for News from a Catholic Perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. The sheriff of Will County, Illinois, says he's never seen anything like this in his 31 years on the job. He reacted today to this week's discovery of more than 2,200 baby remains at the home of an abortion doctor who died earlier this month. It comes as the county wraps up its investigation into the case. Correspondent Jason Calvi has more on the investigation. Why at two states, several investigations, the sheriff in Will County, Illinois, says they still don't know why this doctor was holding those remains in his garage, but they say the evidence points to the babies dating from 2000 to 2002, but the prosecutor there says he's unable to say how far along those babies were. We pray for the mothers of these children. We pray for the babies. Prayers outside the Will County, Illinois coroner's office, which seized more than 2,200 fetal remains from the home of Dr. Ulrich Klopfer, who died earlier this month. There really is no explanation and no excuse because here you have over 2,200 women in Indiana and surrounding states who have been to uh, one of Klopfer's abortion businesses and are out there wondering, could this be my baby? Stephen Aiden represented Allen County, Indiana in its fight with Klopfer. We know that if a girl is pregnant under the age of 15, chances are very good that it was a result of rape, incest, or coercion abuse, some kind of uh, abuse like that. And yet he just didn't care. Uh, he wouldn't report. And when this became known, he lost his, uh, his clinic in, uh, in Fort Wayne. The state of Indiana took away Klopfer's medical license in 2016. South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg now breaks his silence. Like everyone, uh, I find that news out of Illinois extremely disturbing, and uh, I think it's important that that be fully investigated. I also hope that it doesn't get caught up in politics at a time when women need access to health care. Pro-lifers mark the tragedy by focusing on life. And Catholic Cemetery says they would be willing to bury these remains. The officials back in Will County, Illinois, say if any women were patients of Dr. Klopfer from 2000 to 2002 and think that their aborted children may have been in that garage, they can contact the Indiana Attorney General, the person that's going to receive these remains. At the Capitol, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. And joining me now from Capitol Hill is Representative Jackie Walorski, Republican from Indiana. Congresswoman, welcome. This case, as you know, spans from Illinois, where Dr. Kopfler lived, to Indiana, where he performed abortions. As the representative for South Bend, Indiana, what went through your mind when you learned about what was going on? Well, I was absolutely horrified. I was outraged, and probably more than anything else, I was literally sick at the news of what a sick mind this guy had. And previously to my being in Congress, I was in an Indiana State House and had issues with him the entire time that I served there because of the tactics he used. And he performed so many thousands of abortions in Indiana that I would venture to say that a good number of those that are in jars in his house probably do belong to Hoosiers. It's pretty scary. You first called for a federal investigation into this case on Saturday as soon as the reports were emerging. In your mind, what are the questions that still need answering? Oh my gosh, so many questions. Number one, who would do that, right? Who would do that? Number two, where did these babies come from? Um, you know, were they from other states? Um, you know, why was he crossing state lines with those babies? Um, you know, what was he actually up to? And I think what it does, I, I think all these questions, plus the reality and the facts that we know today, lends back to the in, entire issue of why abortion clinics and why the abortion industry needs so much oversight. 
obviously there there are there are so many issues that that we'll probably never know. But that's why you know even two weeks ago here in the Capitol we did a uh, uh, a mock hearing because we can't get a hearing um, in this place right now on protecting babies that live through abortions. And so that was just two weeks ago, and here we are this week talking about. Uh, babies that do die in abortions, and literally now the question of what happens to their remains, that we're going to have to come in and mandate how these babies are taken care of when it comes to final disposal. And so, you know, Indiana does have a law, and it was held, upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court about six months ago, and I think it's worth looking at to take Indiana's law on how to handle the disposition of these, of these babies' bodies when this kind of thing happens, and I think it's worth looking at nationally and having a reporting clause so that when an abortion doctor does perform an abortion, he's, he or she's responsible for telling the government where that baby's body is so that we can stop this kind of potential trade going back and forth between state lines and having more heinous things happen after the abortion already transpires. I think the whole thing is sick. And I think, you know, that one of the things we're hearing on Capitol Hill and, you know, from all over the Midwest is how in the world did this guy do this? How did he transfer these babies out? Did he just take them, put them in a pocket, wrap them in paper? Obviously, he put them in formaldehyde. The whole concept is sick and it has to be addressed. Well, we really appreciate your coming on to talk about this. It is very disturbing for so many people, and so it's why it's, why it's so important that we appreciate your thoughts on this. Representative Jackie Walorski, Republican from Indiana, thank you so much. Thank you so much. A new report out of Syracuse University says the backlog in immigration courts now exceeds one million cases. The Justice Department did not confirm that number, but says, quote, there is a crisis at the border. President Donald Trump toured a section of the U.S.-Mexico border wall yesterday. We've all seen the pictures of young people climbing uh, walls with uh, drugs on their back. A lot of drugs. I mean, they're unbelievable climbers. This wall can't be climbed. President Trump also says the new wall absorbs so much heat that, quote, you won't be able to touch it. He praised Mexico for sending tens of thousands of troops to its border to help slow the flow of migrants to the U.S. Iran's top diplomat warns of all-out war if his country is attacked. The U.S. blames Iran for a drone strike on Saudi Arabia's oil industry. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo traveled to the region this week to talk to America's allies. I was here in an act of diplomacy while the foreign minister of Iran is threatening all-out war to fight to the last American. Uh, we're here to build out a, a coalition aimed at achieving peace and a peaceful resolution of this. That's my mission set. Secretary Pompeo says it is abundantly clear Iran conducted the attacks on Saudi Arabia. So far, no one has retaliated. Israel remains politically deadlocked two days after the country's election, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu makes a direct appeal to his rival. Netanyahu asked former military chief Benny Gantz to meet with him to form a broad unity government, but Gantz doesn't seem keen to the offer. President Reuven Rivlin says he will consult with every political party starting Sunday to try to resolve the situation. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is apologizing for wearing brown face makeup at a 2001 costume party. I'm going to be uh, asking Canadians to forgive me for what I did. I shouldn't have done that. I take responsibility for it. It was a dumb thing to do. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm pissed off. The photo appeared in a yearbook from the school where Trudeau was a teacher before he entered politics. He says the party's theme was Arabian Nights. Trudeau is running for re-election. He launched his campaign exactly one week ago. The Vatican's Department for Promoting the New Evangelization is hosting an international meeting to discuss atheism and religious indifference. This is one of the first times the Vatican is hosting a public event to talk about the current crisis of faith. More than 20 different countries are participating in the conference. The group will meet with Pope Francis on Saturday. Monsignor Krzysztof Marcianowicz, official of the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization, joins us from Rome. Monsignor, can you describe the current crisis of faith as seen by the Vatican? You know, we started to uh, reflect today actually about this crisis. Uh, we want to see it not only like a crisis that affects us, you know, and 
uh, we want to see it like a challenge because we stay like St. Paul, you know, in front of non-believers and we want to uh, improve how to speak to them, how to deliver our testimony and it's our joy. We want to discuss that. So the crisis we see like an opportunity to, to speak actually to those who uh, not believe in God. And as you know, there are so many challenges to, for the church. Europe is more and more secular, for example, and much of the same is true in the United States. In your view, how is indifference to religion affecting society? I think, you know, that we uh, can see uh, that the religious indifference, you know, to affect people in very, very different uh, and many ways, unfortunately. For example, at this official level, we can see how uh, the, the EU Parliament uh, literally banned the, any discussion about the, an absolute, about the God himself. Uh, if we think about the preambula for the uh, Constitution of Europe, that actually did not make it and it's not uh, been voted. But uh, the, the preambula, in the preambula of this constitution, uh, the word God was literally banned. And uh, uh, the, the, if, if we try to even speak about the God, uh, it's only reserved in Europe, but not only Europe, I think in the whole Western civilization, it's, it's, it's reserved only for a, a private life. Like in the public life, there is no space for God. And that's one of the ways that the, the, the religious indifference affects, uh, affects actually our, our life, our everyday life. It, it is a very difficult situation then. How do you think the Vatican's approach to this, the Vatican's plan to push back on secularism and atheism and to evangelize in modern society, how, how does the Vatican stay resolute about this when there are so many challenges? You know, first of all, I think we don't we don't have to speak about the, uh, about the atheism and religious in, uh, re religious indifference like um, only in the in the philosophical terms, like if it was some phenomena, you know, and and that's it. We need to fight uh, with them on a philosophical basis. You know, it's 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 completely different also for us Catholics. Uh, and for us who believe in God, because we know that we can convert someone when we pray for this person, actually. Uh, it's a grace, you know, it's an order of grace also that we try to uh, um, open somebody's eyes, not by force of an argument only. It's, of course, it's very important to present our faith from, uh, from a reasonable point of view. But on the other hand, it is very important to show our spirituality so many important values that you describe and so many important things that we as individuals and the church have to do together. Monsignor Christoph Marcianovich, official of the Pontifical Council for promoting the new evangelization, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Coming up, tensions remain high with Iran as the country's top diplomat warns of an all-out war, how the U.S. is responding. An appeals court in California says Evan Minton, who identifies as transgender, can proceed with a discrimination lawsuit against a Catholic hospital. Minton, who was born a woman, had scheduled a hysterectomy at Mercy San Juan Medical Center in California. It was canceled after Minton told a nurse it's for a gender reassignment. Dignity Health, who runs the hospital, quickly transferred the surgery to a non-Catholic facility. The court ruled Minton's complaint is valid because Dignity Health only offered the alternative after being pressured to do so by Minton's advocates. Join us now via Skype is Dr. Gracie Christie, Senior Policy Advisor with the Catholic Association, and she's also a practicing radiologist. Gracie, welcome back. Dignity Health said in a statement to the Sacramento Bee newspaper, it does not provide elective sterilizations. Is it within its right, first off, not to do so? Of course, it's within the religious liberty uh, rights of a hospital and any doctor, any physician, any medical provider to not do certain things that they find uh, that obstructs their, their exercise of free religious liberty. And for a Catholic, sterilize, uh, procedures that cause um, lasting sterilization are not allowed. So I mentioned that Dignity Health is the operator who runs the hospital. Tell us a little bit more what we know about Dignity Health and especially what they do with uh, that Catholic hospital in particular in California. 
So Dignity Health, Health is run along the, the ways that Catholic hospitals are run in general. Certain procedures aren't done. But the important thing to know about this case is that the Catholic hospital is not uh, discriminating against this patient, this person, because they simply do not do this procedure as an elect, on an elective basis on anybody who asks. It's not because the person wants to have a transition, it's because she's asking for her healthy uterus to be removed. And you know, a hysterectomy is a very invasive procedure. It's a surgical procedure with lots of attendant risks. Well, in this case, the defendant, Evan Minton, who I mentioned, has received a diagnosis of gender dysphoria from the American Psychiatric Association. Can you tell us about that condition? What does that mean? What are its implications? Gender dysphoria means that the person is not comfortable psychologically with their sex, with the reality of their sex. If I'm a woman, I wish I weren't a woman or I'm not comfortable being a woman. This is the case. And these transition therapies, which are surgeries and hormones, lifelong hormones, um, they are invasive and, and really experimental treatments that are not accepted by the entire medical community as a good treatment for what is a psychological disturbance. So how do you, then do you think we as Catholics should approach something like this particular condition and how do we treat that person who might feel that way? Well, we have to realize that this is a very real psychological uh, pain that these people are experiencing. They really aren't comfortable with the way that they're made, with the way that they're naturally formed. Um, but at the same time, we have to also stand up for religious liberty and also the liberty of doctors and nurses to treat patients according to what they believe is best for the patient and not do invasive surgical and hormonal procedures um, that in the end will cause more harm than good. Well, obviously this is a very important case uh, because of its widespread implications. So we'll continue to follow this uh, and obviously continue to watch all this from how we approach this from a Catholic perspective. Dr. Gracie Christie, Senior Policy Advisor with the Catholic Association, thanks so much for your analysis. Thank you. Tonight on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, host Catherine Hadro talks to Michaeline Fredenberg from MiscarriageHurts.com, a digital platform bringing hope and healing to women and men impacted by miscarriage. So there's this thought of if I heal, if I let go of the pain, I will have forgotten this child. Um, but those are two different, you will never forget. You're never gonna forget your child and we won't forget them either. You can see more of Catherine's interview tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. Visit EWTN.com for additional times. Up next, a bill to decriminalize abortion fails in Ecuador. We'll have analysis. And the First Lady helps reopen the Washington Monument. A bill to decriminalize abortion in all cases of rape failed in the Ecuadorian legislature Tuesday. The measure would have allowed abortion in cases of rape or fetal abnormality. Archbishop Alfredo Jose Espinosa Mateus of Quito issued a statement saying, in part, quote, abortion cannot be the answer that a civilized society gives to the pain and anguish of women, men, and their families. He goes on to say, quote, no law that legalizes the death of a defenseless human being can be ethical. Join me now by Skype from Ecuador is Nancy Tosi, Latin American advisor for Human Life International, a Catholic pro-life apostolate. Nancy, welcome in. As a pro-life native of Ecuador, you work to help defeat this measure. Why was it so important that you do that? You talk to representatives ahead of the vote. Thank you, Wyatt. I've been working on these issues for 38 years now, so it's been a long time. Um, we are fighting because we don't want Ecuador to be one of those countries that are killing their kids. That is very important. And sadly, in Latin America, we are having attacks. It's an everyday thing in all our countries. Ecuador, of course, is a small country, but there are many people who are working against life, against family, and against our faith. And that is very important to be fought right now. We have to do it now. It's, uh, it's a matter of saving our country from all these uh, attacks. Let me follow up with you on that because you mentioned those pro-abortion advocates who some have even clashed with police since the vote, saying the they say restrictions will lead to women seeking illegal, unsafe abortions. 
tell me a little bit more about that climate like there in Ecuador when it comes to the debate between the pro-life supporters and those pro-abortion forces. Okay, the thing is that they were fighting for um, the rape, the, the kids being raped, and the young kids, you know, the young uh, teens being raped. And in Ecuador, we don't have a woman who is in jail because of this. There are rape that, of course, it happens. But the thing is that killing their babies are not going to help their kids. Those uh, teenagers, it's not going to help them because in a matter of time, they will realize what they did and they will go to a uh, pass, uh, post-abortion syndrome, no matter what. So we are adding violence to those women who are really facing rape. Now, the thing is that they are not looking for abortion because of rape. They are looking for abortion for everything because they want to do allow abortion until the ninth month. And so um, it's, it's, it's just a, a fake what they're doing. It's, uh, they're inventing things that are not true. Well, as you know, Nancy, the vote fell just short of the 70 votes it required for approval at the National Assembly. Could we see this challenged in the courts? Uh, yeah, and it's very important to realize that in the first voting, they had 69. The uh, president of the assembly asked them to reconsider, which is very rare. That doesn't happen all the time. And when they did it, there was only 65 votes. So four of the legislators uh, really reconsidered it and went back. They said no to abortion. But it's very important that we haven't done with this because they are already planning to go to the Supreme Court and ask them to uh, make decisions over this. And it's very important to know that five of the nine judges are pro-choice. So we are in real danger, Wyatt. Okay, well obviously we'll continue to keep our eye on all things going on with this legislative issue. And obviously I know people around the world will continue to pray for the pro-life efforts there in Ecuador. Nancy Tosi, Latin thank America so Advisor much. for Human Life International, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Wyatt. One of Washington, D.C.'s biggest tourist attractions is back in business after a three-year closure. Well, it's such a great honor to have the First Lady with us today for the reopening of the Washington Monument. First Lady Melania Trump was joined by fourth graders and leaders of the National Park Service for today's ribbon cutting, although her scissors didn't quite work. The Washington Monument was restored with a new visitor screening facility and modern elevators. The old elevators kept breaking down after the landmark suffered earthquake damage in 2011. The First Lady took the first ceremonial ride up, which now takes only 70 seconds. A lot of locals and visitors to Washington are happy the monument is back open. And that concludes our newscast for tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.